Gentleman, Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas. I thank my colleague from Texas, um, and I appreciate the, the witnesses for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Um, I would uh, ask one uh, general question, I mean, I think of each of you. I mean, it, I think it is uh, important as a backdrop in terms of what we're talking about in terms of the spending levels that it would be um, uh, appropriate to say that if you take the appropriations bills that Republicans have put forward to date, we've passed seven on the floor, we've passed another three out of committee uh, that have either been considered on the floor or, or in the midst of being considered on the floor, and then two, Labor H, and then obviously CJS that we might um, deal with tomorrow that didn't go through committee and went straight to the floor. I share the gentleman's preference, and I think that over here that, that it would have gone through committee before going to the floor, but, but we're, we are where we are in that. But the, the main point, though, is on the overall spending level. Is, is it fair to say that if you take and add up all of the appropriations bills that we have passed out um, out of committee or these two at the spending levels that were set by the committee as they came to the floor, that the total spending levels would uh, achieve roughly, I think, about a 1584, 1586, something like that, top line. Um, and I, 1586. Yeah. And that which is a few billion acknowledged below the 1590 FRA level. Uh, so you could, I, I guess you could kind of uh, quibble over, you know, what's been cut in those, in that $4 billion. But putting that aside, it effectively is spending in compliance with the ceiling that was set in the highly bipartisan FRA. Is that a, yes. is a fair statement? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Sure. It's $152 billion below the bipartisan budget agreement and all of the cuts are on the non-defense side. $152 billion. $152 billion below. So 1586 is $152 billion below? Below the bipartisan budget agreement. But I, I would like to explore that. So $152 billion. And it's so all on, understand, the, it's all on the non-defense side. So $150 yeah, but the, the, the FRA agreement, which was struck, acknowledged a plus-up in defense of roughly 3%, $28 billion, and of non-defense uh, that would then uh, make up in order to achieve FRA. But, but, but I think this is actually no, important. No, non-defense was cut. Right, in, in, was in cut. the agreement in the FRA. Yes, agreed. which was overwhelmingly, oh, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, overwhelmingly supported. I think that, that would, one has to go back to the premise that there was a budget agreement and if I said many times here, I voted against the budget agreement. Same. Well, but it was overwhelming, overwhelmingly supported. Sure. And the reason why I voted for it was one, appropriations was not part of the process. <coughs> and secondly, I was very concerned as to what the level of the, uh, 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 of the allocations were, 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 going, were going to be and with regard to non-defense appropriations. And I say that because, I come from a defense-dependent state, so I don't have any problems with that, that side of it. However, <laughs> the, you all walked away from the budget agreement and the fiscal responsibility bill. Without, within a week's period of time, you said no, that those top lines were not uh, uh, to be followed. And that is still what is happening now. So when you bifurcate what you're doing, you're going to, there is no allocation for each one of the, uh, of the subcommittees. So you go, you, you'll plus up one, lower ones, ones that you like, ones that you don't like, and so forth, which is really madness here in terms of a process to get us to a budget. So, but $69 so getting, billion dollars sure. in additional spending outside of the this, this, is an important, this is an important point, yeah, because sure. if, if the gentlelady is correct, that it is missing $152 billion mm -hmm. uh, when it, is, in fact, mathematically, undeniably, adds up to 1586, give or take, a, a couple of billion, again, within rounding errors. It, it, it's, it's just a mathematical truism that what we're talking about in terms of the appropriations bills that Republicans have put forward, right. that the programmatic spending levels add up to roughly, again, roughly 1586. That then if there's $152 billion allegedly missing, then what I'd like to understand is, is what is that? 
And I think for the American people to understand, it generally wants to correct or add something to yeah, it. No, no, I don't have to, I don't have to okay, correct. Well, what you're not, not considering is that you've got $152 Precision. billion dollars below the bipartisan agreement. What you're not addressing is well, the, I'm addressing. the $69 billion that was for emergency for base, for COVID and commerce, for the IRS rescission, and, so, and, 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 and the chimps, which added up to $69 billion. And that's exactly my point, and I thank you for making it. Because I'm happy, this, happy. I, I right. want, let's be accurate with the facts. Okay, well, there, I am being be accurate, accurate with the facts. The programmatic spending level last year, $1.602 trillion. That's a mathematical fact. That was the, that's the programmatic spending level for, for DOD, for all of the non-defense programs, and obviously you've got veterans and uh, some that are uh, uh, energy and some that are part defense and part non-defense. So you've got a 1.602 level. And the question was, what was going to be our spending level? FRA was going to be at basically 1590 at the programmatic spending level, representing a reduction. 1586 would have been the automatic 1% across the board level. These are the numbers that we're looking at for the actual programmatic spending level. But the, but the, 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 the deal that was struck, which, which many of us tried to point out back in Memorial Day, was that there would be effectively backfill. Like if you look at the, the White House's own documentation when they were putting it out and putting it forward. $886 billion for defense, $121 billion for veterans uh, medical care. Uh, and that defense level, this is the White House's own document that they put out, President Biden, comma, Democrat, budget level, 3% increase for defense, that's 886. Right. The veterans medical care, budget level, they put that number out, $121 billion. And then it says $637 billion for other non-defense programs, taking into account all agreed upon adjustments virtually equal to 2023. That'd be 637. That all adds up to 1644. Now, that would represent about a $54 billion number greater than the 1590 that we've been talking about in terms of the uh, overall spend with respect to relative to the 1602 last year in the omnibus spending bill. My point of that is the gentlelady doesn't uh, think the numbers are actually re reflected or, or uh, didn't support it for a variety of reasons that she's already described. Um, for concerns about not spending enough. I have colleagues on my side of the aisle who were trying to explain to the world that we were that the spending levels were going to be something they weren't going to be. That's the, that's the reality, because this is the problem here that we're talking about with respect to it. I'm keeping my time for a second. The problem we have here is that we've got $54 billion that we know of in chimps and in uh, other accounts, the $22 billion sitting at the Commerce Slush Fund, which we had an entire exchange in this committee about, where my Republican colleague, Mr. Schweikert, came in and said, well, why aren't we using that to pay for the um, Israel funding? Or why are we using that to pay for the FEMA disaster aid? You know why we're not using that, ladies and gentlemen? Because it's already set aside for this town and appropriators to use to backfill to spend more. That's the truth. And so we've got that money. $54 billion. You've got chimps, which no one in America understands what those are. And that that's why we continue to spend at levels that are blowing the lid off of, of no, spending. No, I, I, excuse me. I want to say, with all due respect to the gentleman, and I have high regard for your your your, your knowledge and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the dealing with, with, with the numbers, but I don't know what you do know about, an, about the Appropriations Committee or the history of the Appropriations Committee and, and what it does and how it does it. The fact of the matter is, let's not get away from, you all agreed, maybe you didn't, but the bulk of your colleagues, yes, and my colleagues, voted for a budget agreement. That was all part of it. But you made a determination. You know, civics class, 101. You pass it in the House, you pass it in the Senate, and the President signs it. It's the law of the land. Now, you chose not to go with the law of the land. You have come up with some other construct to deal with it. Each bill on its own, depending on whether you like the bill or you don't like the content of the bill. That is not the way the process needs to be worked. You agreed. Whether I didn't agree, you didn't agree, but the bulk of the people in this body, in the democratic process, agreed to it. It is the law of the land. That's what we should be sure. following and doing well, it. You bifurcate lady, the bills, you if, bifurcate if, the bills, and those bills bifurcated means that you will like ag, and you'll increase the number, though the bill went down on the floor. You don't like Labor H, so you'll do it in. 
Now, that is one hell of a way to run a railroad. Well, if the gentlelady would like to explain, if, if, the if the gentlelady would like to explain, if the gentlelady would like to point in the bill, uh, in the law of the land that she just described, where the $54 billion is with respect to Chimps, could you, if you could point that out in the FRA, I'd love to see it. All I know is it was agreed to by the former speaker of this house. Oh. If that isn't enough for you guys to move on, then I don't know what the heck to say to you. So that's the law of the land, side deals. That's how yeah. this town works, ladies and gentlemen. So. Yeah. Here's the, here's the fact. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're looking at here is a reality that everybody understands that has unfolded this year, is that we've been working hard to break apart a very badly broken appropriations process and try to rebuild it in such a way that the American people could possibly understand or to possibly understand why we continue to spend money we don't have. And what I would tell for the, for the folks out there, you know, following this on C-SPAN diligently, no doubt at home, uh, the reality is, um, that's the, 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 the re resistance we get, frankly, from staff, and I say that as a former staffer, as a chief of staff in the Senate, as a lawyer on the Senate Judiciary Committee, the resistance we get from staff from daring to ask questions as members of Congress of the Appropriations Committee, daring to ask questions as to where this money is going, how it's being used, the resistance we've gotten all year, and it is being amplified at this exact moment, because what the gentlelady just referred to is exactly the problem, and I don't cast aspersions to her description. It is precisely what we've gotten from both sides of the aisle, that if we dare ask a question about where all of these numbers are, that don't show up in black and white for the American people to see, that that somehow is a problem, that if there's a deal struck, okay, don't worry, here's where the spending levels will be, be here's what will be written into the FRA, Here's what will be passed on law for us to see on the floor of the House. And then there's all of a sudden side deals that are done to say, don't worry about it. We'll be able to use this account over here. We'll be able to, we'll be able to fund that program. Don't worry about it. The absolute abject resistance I got, even under this current uh, Speaker's office, when I raised the question mm -hmm. about using the $22 billion of the Commerce Slush Fund to be able to fund Israel, it was just like, oh, my God, you can't touch that. Don't touch that account. That's the appropriator's account. That's just the truth. That's what we've run into. Was so the gentleman would, yield I, for I one just, second? I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on from that topic, just talk about the CR just out of- Will the gentleman yield right. for a second? I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna move to the CR okay. if, if I can. Uh, I think, it's important th think about this. revenues. Think about revenues. Oh, we, we've had a serious conversation about revenues think, here and what we've already think established Think about revenues here. and how much you're not and collecting. What we've, what we've established what here in this committee- you don't want to collect. Time and time again about revenues. What we've yeah. established here in this committee, time and time again about mm -hmm. revenues, is that 19.2% of GDP is brought in in terms of revenues to the federal uh, government, in terms of what we're bringing into the Treasury. The third, among the three highest levels in the history of the United States, that is what we brought in in 2022. Now, we can argue about whether we could bring in more as a percentage of the outlays. This is all according to the Federal Reserve. We could argue about what those out outlays uh, uh, should be in terms of what, I'm not outlays, in terms of what we should be bringing into the Treasury. That's debatable. It's debatable about how we do it. It's debatable about where the tax burden falls, whether it should yeah. fall on individual X or individual Y, corporation X, corporation Y. That's all, I think, a reasonable debate. But the idea that you're gonna solve our spending problem when we're at the third highest level or among the three highest levels of revenue to the Treasury we've ever had as a percentage of our gross domestic product, is facially absurd, and it's part of the problem well, why we wh continue wh to go What's absurd the is allowing corporations to pay nothing. Okay, but, but if, 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 the, if the general lady's position is that we're allowing corporations to pay, to pay nothing, zero. to pay nothing, then you can go down the road of trying to come up with policies to change that, but it will not change the fact at the moment. You can't that get that moment, here because the Republicans a, won't be for it. It will change the fact Gentlemen at the moment controls. that the federal government is bringing in among the third highest levels of receipts to the Treasury it ever has as a percentage of GDP, according to the Federal Reserve. Not true. I assume the Federal Reserve is lying. I assume the Federal Reserve is inaccurate in its percentage of GDP that is being brought in. The Department into the of Treasury. Treasury will tell you how much is being left on the table a okay. trillion dollars, and a so, trillion and, dollars and every the year. Lady, if the gentlelady is correct that a trillion dollars is being left on the table, then go find the trillion dollars, but it won't change the fact that what we're bringing into the Treasury is among the third highest we've ever brought in. The fact is, we've only brought in between roughly 15 and 19% of, of GDP into the federal government since World War II. That's the actual mathematic put on a chart Federal Reserve truth. And so the fact that, oh, 
Well, I we guess I magically, challenge your facts. We're going to so magically bring in twenty five percent or thirty percent mm -hmm. of GDP and cripple the American economy in the process, cripple jobs by going out and taxing our, our, our oh. uh, job the, the, creators the, into the oblivion. The job creators Please, who so buy stock wanna, options. Wanna, the well, gentleman from Texas controls the time. I understand that. Talk no, we don't have, I'm done. Our awesome stenographer. But, but the reality is, when we talk about revenue, that's, that's the truth. Ridiculous. And so we want to talk about spending, which is what this is about. What we've tried to do is produce, whether the colleagues on the other side of the aisle like it or not, and I would, and I would compliment the gentleman for the bill that he's put forward, because it's, it's adhering mm -hmm. with the tenets of the FRA in terms mm -hmm. of the overall spending level. It's achieving the objective that was laid out under the FRA in terms of the spending level. And if we're going to find the cuts, they got to come from somewhere. And so they're going to come from some aspect of the programs that are, that are being put forward. I think there are things we could have done more, things maybe you could have done less. But I want to compliment the gentleman for what he's done to try to achieve the objective we laid out to achieve, to reduce spending on the discretionary account as one step towards the many we've got to do to achieve fiscal sanity. But one thing that I, I want to ask about the continuing resolution, because it's important because we're all debating it. And I understand that I think the gentleman supports it on behalf of the speaker, and a good number of my colleagues will, I think, uh, do so. I oppose the continuing resolution on, on October 1, um, and, and I will oppose this continu continuing resolution. But, but I think it, it merits um, recognizing that this continuing resolution and, I, and, I, and tell me, the gentleman, just tell me if you think I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, if, the, if, if any of this is incorrect, that this will continue the spending levels of the omnibus bill from last December, which was the $1.6 trillion spending level, and will do so for at least 60 to 75 days, depending on the, the, the various accounts, right? It will spend at that level. And it will do so, which means basically spending about $268 billion over the next two months, a little more than that, actually, for the ones that extend to February 2nd at the... Uh, levels of the omnibus spending bill, that level being $131 billion higher than the previous year of 2022. And the reason I think that's important is I just want to establish for our colleagues who, who may be watching this is that's what we're talking about. A FY23 omnibus spending bill passed in December right before Christmas, which we say we want to avoid. We're going to continue to perpetuate spending at that level, which is $131 billion higher than the FY22 level. And we're going to do that with the policies embedded in it that were adopted at the time, while we have a $2 trillion deficit. And when last week, Moody's downgraded the US federal debt outlook to negative due to the burgeoning interest rates, debt, and deficits. And we just had a Treasury auction that was uh, less than stellar for the United States government. It would continue to fund the Department of Homeland Security, uh, led by Alejandro Mayorkas, that has released some 2 trillion, I mean, sorry, 2 million people into the United States. Uh, including uh, allowing 1.7 million gotaways into the United States, and we offer no policy prescriptions in doing so for the next 60 to 75 days of funding. It will continue to fund the United Nations to the tune of 12.5 billion, including UNRWA, which has dollars which go directly and indirectly to the Palestinians and therefore Hamas, which is counter to our interest in standing alongside Israel. It will fund the, continue to fund the proxy war uh, that we've got going on with Russia, in, including the $300 million that we just voted down in September in the DOD appropriations bill. It'll continue to fund and extend the authorization of the uh, COVID uh, state with respect to uh, PAPA, BARDA, and CDC and NIH. Now, I would, I would note that a lot of those have been addressed in the Labor H bill, and I, wanna, I do want to compliment the mm -hmm. gentleman and the appropriations efforts in trying to address some of those things. Mm -hmm. But the CR, of course, by definition, does not, right? We will continue to perpetuate mm -hmm. a lot of the things that were addressed in Labor H. Uh, it continues to fund critical race theory and DEI at the Office of the Pentagon. It continues to fund the abortion, terrorism, and transgender surgeries at the Department of Defense. It continues to fund the Department of Justice ATF's pistol brace ban. It continues to fund the EPA's uh, attack on the internal combustion engine. It continues to fund uh, farm, uh, and it extends the farm bill to September 30th with no reforms to food stamps, no reforms to FDA, USDA tyranny over the small ag in favor of big ag, no fixes to Chinese Communist Party ownership of U.S. farmland. I could go on and on. Those are the realities of what happens when you extend last year's funding levels as the majority party here. Um, I just think uh, we should try to do better, and I don't believe that this is the right approach that we should pursue. I would yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from New Mexico. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I think it's really important